Hello everybody, my name is Ray. Welcome to the Evangelical Dark Web. Today we're going to be diving into the Sex Abuse Task Force report of the Southern Baptist Convention. This report cost millions of dollars and really very little to show for it as far as a million dollar investigation goes. But we do have one particular new detail and that is uh, Johnny Hunt being accused of sexual assault. We will talk about that. That is the major story out of the sex abuse task force. And we're also going to be talking about how they want the Southern Baptist Convention to set up a separate entity to pay the damages of people who commit sex abuse. So, you know, in Baptist polity, churches get together pool their resources for missions, and now this report actually wants them to pool their resources together for liability. That is not how Baptist polity works. It will be interesting to see how these um, recommendations move forward. So this is the report table of contents. It was released earlier today, and by today I mean uh, May 22nd. It was supposed to be public at 4 o'clock, but obviously, here's the thing, and here's the dirty thing about the Southern Baptist Convention. This report was being passed around by a lot of liberals prior to its public release. Russell Moore, for instance, had an article ready about 30 minutes after this was posted. You could not have read it and written an article in time in 30 minutes. Could not have done that. But obviously, the fact that some people have early access to this was not a surprise. I mean, it's the Southern Baptist Convention. Expect corruption. Expect a boys club and just a lot of other things. So there's a lot of uh, crap in this, but let's let's just start out with the executive summary. Uh, I want to highlight this line. Our investigation revealed that for many years, a few senior EC executive committee leaders, along with outside counsel, largely controlled the EC's response to these reports of abuse. They closely guarded information about abuse allegations and lawsuits, which were not shared with EC trustees, and singularly focused on avoiding liability for the SBC to the exclusion of other considerations. Uh... So what I want to say about that is that very few people, apparently, according to this executive summary, were actually part of the issue. And that's not to say that there was no issue. That's to say that the issue was not as systemic. It was more leadership than systemic. That is according to the report. Now, I do want to go back to the table of contents because we're going to not focus on the methodology and scope. We're going to skip this section as well. The timeline is is pretty interesting, but I got to be honest. It is the bulk of this is a timeline portion, but the bulk of that timeline has to do with motions that are made or in some instances, we got some interesting stuff. So let's go in that direction because you'll you'll see that it has to do with a lot of uh, motions that are made. It does talk a lot about uh, James Patterson. Oh, uh, sorry, James Mayer and Paige Patterson. Talks a lot about them. Uh, let's get to the section on Mike Stone. So this is a 2019. This is a new allegation that is sur- or a surfacing allegation, I, I suppose. I don't know much about this allegation prior to this, but does it shed light on why Mike Stone was Brett Kavanaugh at the 2021 annual Southern Baptist Convention? Perhaps, but let's be real about what this allegation is, and it's not Mike Stone doing something inappropriate. And to be honest, this is not Mike Stone covering up sex abuse either. This is a gross overplaying of the hand by this report. And I think the language in this report is irresponsible as it relates to this incident. So in 2019, during the period when Mike Stone was EC chairman, a married pastor, 
of an SBC church in Georgia was accused of having an inappropriate relationship with a single mother by several members of his congregation. Now, here's a problem with this report. And one of the overarching problems in this report is it does not name names. It uses a lot of euphemisms and codes, and I get the idea of protecting the identity of survivors, but this is not a survivor. And I'm going to get to that in a second. This is not a survivor of sex abuse. Or at least if she is a survivor of sex abuse, it has nothing to do with the incident we're about to talk about. Uh, meanwhile, again, if a pastor committed sexual misconduct, why is that name being hidden as well? The woman was in council. Okay, so a married pastor of an SBC church in Georgia. So not Mike Stone's church either, or else it would have said that. I think it's, uh, again, I think this is a little bit of a stretch to connect it to Mike Stone, in my opinion, but it's not Mike Stone's church or else it would have said Mike Stone's church. Instead, it doesn't name the church, doesn't name the pastor, doesn't name the uh, supposed victim. Uh, was accused of having an inappropriate relationship with a single mother by several members in, of his congregation. The woman was in counseling with the pastor who had been sending her text messages and photographs that were sexually suggestive. Uh, sexually suggestive is not sexually explicit. So I don't know what the nature of these text messages are because it doesn't say. Are these just innuendos? Are Is this person coming on to her? Uh, is this person maybe making a bad joke? What is the nature of these text messages? Sexually suggestive could be content out of a PG movie. We need actual pics or it didn't happen. But there's no pics. And I guess that's one of the frustration is like we're making claims here but they're not really substantiated because they don't you know, we're not supposed, we cannot make assumptions off of this situation based off the description here. These text messages and photographs were viewed by witnesses who were interviewed during our investigation. If these were nude photographs, it would say sexually explicit, not suggestive. So I don't know what the nature of these photographs were or these texts. So I, I just urge caution on how far we take this. And again, according to witnesses, the pastor agreed to apologize to the congregation and ask for forgiveness. They stated that the apology was drafted in, with, assistance, with the assistance of Mr. Stone. The witnesses recounted that the apology made by the pastor was not accurate and that the survivor was blamed. Survivor, really? You had sexually suggestive, not explicit, and by the way, who among us has not received an unsolicited penis picture? Who among us has not received that at least once in their life? If you have not, consider yourself lucky and way older than me. And not on as many social media apps. So, I, again, I don't consider myself a survivor. Now... That's not to say that this pastor, what this pastor did was right. Obviously, it was not. But that's, this isn't sex abuse. If we call this sex abuse, if we call this person a survivor for having not even unsolicited penis pictures sent to her, we are misusing the word. We are using it flippantly. And that's, again, the major problem I have with this report is how political it is it is a very political report because it's using language entirely flippantly survivor is being used in super flippantly here because this is an inappropriate relationship this is not abuse the witness stated that they felt intimidated by mr stone for bringing the pastor's behavior to the attention of the deacons in the church. 
One witness attempted to call Mr. Stone and was instead contacted by Mr. Stone's assistant who told him that Mr. Stone planned to help the pastor, not the church. Again, that doesn't that could be a complete mischaracterization of what happened there. We don't know. This is based off a phone call. So I assume we don't have recordings of this phone call. During uh, his interview with us, Mr. Stone stated that this pastor was a close friend and that they had attended college together. Mr. Stone acknowledged knowing about this pastor's inappropriate conduct through text messages and stated that he did not receive the information that, uh, that the conduct reached the level of sexual impropriety. He stated that he had not spoken to the pastor in more than a year. So again, remember when I talked about what is sexually explicit, or not sexually explicit, we know what sexually explicit means. What does sexually suggestive mean? And that, I guess, is the distinction. That might be Mr. Stone's thing, and they're trying to hang Mr. Stone on this, uh, Mike Stone on this. And to be honest, we don't know what the nature of the texts are because they didn't provide the text. Picks or it didn't happen. That is an internet rule. Complete failure on this because this report wants to have as many bodies as possible to count as victims. Uh, another instance. Is Jennifer Lyle. She is a prime example in this. Jennifer Lyle is not an abuse survivor. We've talked about this in a video called The Southern Baptist Convention Paid the Whore or something like that. I did a video about, yeah, it pays the adulterous woman. The Southern Baptist Convention pays the adulterous woman. That's who Jennifer Lyle was. She was the adulterous woman that I talked about in that instance. And she received compensation, we don't know how much, from the Southern Baptist Convention for having an affair... With a married man, uh, David Sills, who was a uh, an SBC staffer, as was she. So they both had a sexual relationship ongoing for more than a decade. And they only fired the man and not the woman. She's a homewrecker. She's a homewrecker and she gets to keep her job in an SBC entity. That's not right. That's wrong. She's not a victim. There is nothing in that story that makes sense to her being a victim. And if you look at this report, let's go back to the top. If you look at this report, one of their evidence, evidences of evidence of patterns of intimidation of sexual abuse victims includes several people not liking her, especially Rod Martin. I'm trying to pull it up. Treatment of survivors. So we have a lot of bullet points here. And if we go down here... Dr. Floyd, so that's Ronnie Floyd, did not respond to a text message from Miss Lyle in June 2019 asking to meet. Okay. Mr. Floyd never responded to a June 14th text message of a survivor. Uh, that's a different one. Uh, we want... Uh, they go after Rod Martin specifically. In a hallway conversation, some EC members and staff reportedly referred to survivors as Potiphar's wife, a biblical character who makes a false accusation of rape. Again, could have been in reference to that, um, uh, Jennifer Lyle. An ES, EC trustee, so this is Rod Martin, calls Miss Lyle a professional victim. This is called mistreatment of survivors. 
And then it talks about how a sampling of social media comments concluded, bitter, jealous woman, she's not a victor, she's a sinner. Join me in emailing Lifeway to call for her resignation. She should be fired from her job, which I said, but she's guilty of adultery, not just being compliant. And this has to do with the whole Baptist press story. So again, I talked about this situation where she had a 12-year-long sexual relationship with an SBC staffer that was on and off and at times long distance that she voluntarily continued. It began when she was 26. She was not groomed. And I'm sorry, a seminary professor is not a position of power in which grooming takes place. It's not. That is a master's degree program. And she was 26 when it started. Do women have agency or do they not? So let's go to Johnny Hunt. This is the big findings of this. Uh, this is the big findings of this report. This is the new stuff, and then we're going to talk about the recommendations section because I don't want to take all night with this. So Johnny Hunt was SBC president from twenty eight, or sorry, 20, 2008 to twenty ten, who was immediate, who was the immediate past SBC president at the time, who had sexually assaulted the wife on July 25th, 2010. The allegations include grooming the wife during Dr. Hunt's term as SBC president. First of all, this is a little bit of an overuse of the word grooming. But I'm not entirely sure what the ages are, other than the fact that this guy's like 25 years older. This guy's old enough to be uh, this alleged victim's uh, father. She's old enough to be his daughter. And uh, let's actually read the thing. And I got to say, as a husband, I'm kind of disgusted reading this, that someone you accuse someone of doing the, the types of activities to your wife that we're about to talk about and you don't punch him in the face. You just shake hands and bygones be bygones. You make a, a gentleman's agreement not to hurt each other's careers. I, I'm I, As a husband, I'm astonished by that. And he's not qualified to be a pastor either. If what this is, what this uh, uh, report says is true, both of those people should be out of ministry because they're both unqualified. They do not have the stomach. The uh, repro- they have reproach, and they don't have the integrity. So the husband, so this guy's a pastor, by the way, for 25 years, had a professional relationship with Dr. Hunt, whom he considered a mentor. Pastor and his wife, Survivor, told us that prior to the assault, Dr. Hunt groomed the couple with flattery and promises of help in ministry. The S- An SBC pastor of 25 years, I assume his wife is wasn't like a child and you're using the word grooming. I don't that, that, that word doesn't apply. That word applies to people who are minors. I don't know why we're considering people that have agency, people that our legal system or in culture recognizes that agency is being groomed. I don't like the term being used on that. People who want to put pride flags in classrooms are groomers. Not old dudes that hit on younger chicks. Or, or hit on chicks that are 20 years younger than them, but also still legally adults in every capacity. Which I guess this uh, Johnny uh, Hunt is. Um, they also reported that Dr. Hunt gave an unusual amount of attention to Survivor, including making remarks about her appearance and comments of a sexual nature and unwelcome touching, including kissing her hand. The couple stated that after the assault, they were silenced by Dr. Hunt and the staff 
counselor at First Baptist Church Woodstock, here we're naming churches here, who convinced them that they should not talk about what happened. Recently, as Pastor was completing his doctorate while studying clinical counseling, conflict resolution and peacemaking, and as Survivor entered therapy with a licensed trauma therapist, they began to process what they had experienced and contacted us with this report. So, I want to kind of skip to where the actual allegations are. So let's start here. At the June, uh, we'll skip that. Dr. Hunt is 24 years older than in the couple and in, with daughters in close age to the survivor. The couple did take a short vacation to the beach, staying at separate location and spent some time with the Hunts. At one point, Dr. Hunt kissed the survivor on the forehead and made inappropriate con- comments about the survivor's figure. After the trip, Pastor told Dr. Hunt that Survivor wanted to return to the beach before school started to hear Bobby Bowden speak at the blah, blah, blah. I don't really care about that. On Saturday, July 24th, 2010, Pastor texted Dr. Hunt and asked him to keep an eye out for Survivor. And Dr. Hunt responded that he would take care of her and that his family will keep an eye out. Pastor and Survivor said they trusted Dr. Hunt and were under the impression Dr. Hunt and his family would be at the beach, and Survivor could contact them if she needed. Uh, Dr. Hunt texted her, asking what condo she was in. She responded with the number, and he replied that it was right next door and told her to step out on the balcony. Survivor was surprised that the condo with her husband had her husband had rented was right next door to the Hunt's condo. Dr. Hunt and Survivor conversed from their respective balconies. He brought her a bottle of water. Survivor called Dr. Hunt, shifting the conversation from ministry to flattery about her appearance, her clothing, and her perfume. Dr. Hunt remarked that she was hot from being in the sun that he was hot from being in the sun, and Survivor said that he could come in, come sit inside the shade on her balcony. Survivor described the balconies as side-by-side, side, with no ability to cross from one to the other. Survivor assumed that Dr. Hunt's wife and family were inside his, combo, his condo unit. Dr. Hunt came into Survivor's condo, and they continued their conversation on the Survivor's balcony. Dr. Hunt asked if she felt safe, and she said she did. She did not know why she, he would ask such a question. He then told Survivor to put his feet, to put her feet on his knee. He touched them while commenting on her beauty and size. At one point, he remarked that he was uncomfortable sitting outside because he didn't want to see, be seen, or he did not, he didn't want to be seen. So he suggested that they go inside. Dr. Hunt pointed to the bedroom and said that he guessed that that they didn't need to go in there. She objected emphatically, saying no, in the living room. Dr. Hunt asked about the ministry of the church, ministry and church frustrations. Dr. Hunt slid closer to Survivor while closer while Survivor was telling a story of the stress that she and her husband were about were under at the church. Okay, more personal questions. This is a prelude to what would eventually happen. Dr. Hunt then moved towards Survivor and proceeded to pull her shorts down, turn her over, and stare at her backside. He then made sexual remarks about her body and things that he had imagined about her. During this time, Survivor felt frozen. Survivor said that these were some of the longest moments of her life. She mustered the courage to ask him, uh, could she turn back over? And Dr. Hunt said yes. When she turned back over, she began to pull 
up her shorts. Dr. Hunt then pinned her on the couch, got on top of her, pulled up her shirt. He sexually assaulted her with his hands and mouth. Suddenly, Dr. Hunt stopped, then stood up. Survivor pulled down her shirt. Survivor said she did not want him to she did not want him to ruin his ministry at which he responded he did not want to ruin hers but th he then forced himself on her again by groping her trying to pull her shirt down violent and violently kissing her the su survivor did not reciprocate but rather stood eyes open and very stiff hoping he would just stop and leave he finally stopped and left so that is the I, I believe that's the climax of the assault allegations that's pretty serious that's really bad that that's a crime that's a crime And obviously, that's unbefitting of a pastor. Now, Johnny Hunt d vigorously denies these allegations. This report does not consider Johnny Hunt to be a credible witness. But, you know, again, the problem that I have with this event is that they basically made a gentleman's agreement. And it, that's sickening. On August 5th, Mr. Blankenship, I believe he's the counselor, brought Dr. Hunt's, Hunt, his wife, pastor and survivor, in together for a meeting at Hope Quest, a counseling ministry to cl bring closure to the events on the 25th of July. Dr. Hunt and Mr. Blankenship stated that they could get never talk about what happened, and if they did, it would negatively impact over 40,000 churches Dr. Hunt represented. Dr. Hunt asked for the pastor's forgiveness, and the pastor said he agreed. After the pastor agreed, Dr. Hunt asked Pastor, if Dr. Hunt needed to step down from FBC Woodstock, Pastor said no. So, you know, when I look at a case, it could be a, cr a story of like criminal case, right? I look at what the defense says and I often judge the defense based off their own defense. And oftentimes I think the defense uh, makes it worse. Uh, for instance, there was a local murder in which uh, a dude killed his ex-girlfriend, but his defense was he was trying to kill himself and she got in the way, which honestly I thought was actually worse. So situations like that. Uh, he got a very soft sentence for that too, which sucks. But anyway, this is an accusation though. And this accusation, this pastor literally l just said, let bygones be bygones, shook the dude who molested his wife's hand and then continued on being a pastor. This is the type of it, along with Dr. Hunt here, who vigorously denies these allegations, by the way, this is just disgraceful. The caliber of pastor that it is in Big Eva. So then it goes into issues uh, corroborating. So Mr. Blankenship, the uh, counselor, said he basically didn't want to talk because he didn't want to disclose uh, things that uh, he didn't want to disclose things that were said in confidence despite the waiver. But apparently he did talk a little bit more. The, con the report considers him to be credible. So he's the guy that's kind of mediating this hush hush agreement between survivor and pastor 
and Dr. Hunt. So he's the one mediating the hush hush. And, you know, he's considered a credible witness in, th- in this report. Uh, so I think we should talk more about the, uh, let's talk more about the solutions that this report has. Because again, this report largely told us events we already knew about. That's the sad thing about this report. We paid, or not we, I'm not a Southern Baptist. The Southern Baptist Convention paid millions of dollars in legal fees to come up with this report. And ultimately, it, this report's not worth millions of dollars. I don't think it takes millions of dollars to have found out the information on uh, Johnny Hunt. And here's the other thing about the report. Capstone report, a very conservative outlet in the Southern Baptist circles. Capstone Report talked about how the... He talked about how Kevin Ezell was reported on to the report. So there was a report about Kevin Ezell that this report does not mention. So this report is only mentioning people that are targeted... Compared to the actual issue, if they didn't follow up on this report, so that that's a capstone report that noted that in their critique of this report. So let's go towards the recommendations. And the recommendations, some are good, some are not so good. And honestly, because if we look at the credentials committee, I don't think they have a bad track record. I don't think this report shows conclusively that the credentials committee is a failure. So this is about a stat. So most of the solutions that they talk about, if I wanted to put it in a nutshell, they talk about establishing more bureaucracy. More bureaucracy is their answer. And pay us. That's the other answer. Pay, pay up, establish more bureaucracy so you can pay up. That it kind of goes hand in hand. So we're going to have an oversights committee. This is the recommendation two: creation of an administrative agency to provide permanent resource for prevention and response efforts related to sex abuse. Uh, So this would be, uh, I want to more bureaucracy training. Again, training isn't bad unless it's woke, obviously, or feminist. Enhance prevention resources. Devote resources to survivor uh, support. Here we go. This is part of B. Establish a survivor compensation fund program. We recommend the survivor compensation fund program be committed and overseen by the commission administered by an agency. Uh, This is about creating a new entity in the cooperative program. As you can see in this bullet point here, we recommend that the compensation program be supported by a dedicated permanent fund established and replenished with cooperative program dollars and or selling SBC assets to be prioritized by the SBC Executive Committee. There goes the bombshell. That's the bombshell here. They want to establish a compensation fund so that the mission dollars grandma gives to Lottie Moon ends up paying for some dirtbag who groomed a who was a youth minister that groomed a uh, student. We should not be sending missions dollars to be defending and compensating for 
unqualified, unregenerate, and degenerate ministers. This is wrong. This is not where missions, funding, and resources should go. They are asking the cooperative program to cooperate in the liability of SBC elites. SBC elites get to get off the hook. They get to use Southern Baptist money to pay for the damages that they do behind closed doors and abuse of their offices. This is wrong. They should have to pay for damages out of their own pocket, not the people that give to the Southern Baptist Convention out of the stupidity of thinking that they are giving to missions. That And, you know, starting non-woke churches and stuff. Or training non-woke seminaries. The people gullible enough to believe that they're not doing those, or they are not training woke pastors and planting woke churches. The people that think that they're not doing that or the people that overtly want to. You know, they don't give to that program so that they can compensate for elitist and their misdoings. Now, here's one positive thing to mention is that they do have a thing about NDAs. Consider prohibiting confidentiality agreements and sex abuse matters. I, I do like that suggestion. And again, Bobby Lopez, who I've had on this stream, I've had Bobby Lopez on Evangelical Dark Web. I've gone on his stream actually more. And he always talks about this. He tried to get a resolution submitted on prohibiting and standing against, standing against non-disclosure agreements. He tried to do that. The SBC is all about NDAs. They're all about NDAs. So that's just a brief summary of the report. Uh, another follow-up news is that Johnny Hunt, just to show how small this world is, uh, has some connections to the Ravi Zacharias Spa. So... Last year, we talked about Ravi Zacharias and how Ravi Zacharias basically loved himself some happy ending massages, which as a Christian minister is wrong, sinful, degenerate, but he loved himself some happy ending massages. And apparently Johnny Hunt was involved in the uh, spa. It's, it's kind of weird in my opinion. And honestly, spa sounded like a money laundering scheme in my opinion. So there's just certain things. And obviously with the whole thing, the concept of the happy ending massages and stuff like that, pastors have no business trying to, you know, avoid the appearance of wrongdoing by not investing in cash based, uh, sexually associated businesses. So that was unwise at best. And obviously Johnny Hunt could be doing his own thing there at worst because Robbie Zacharias liked to. So that's just something interesting to note. And again, uh, this Johnny Hunt guy does uh, deny the allegations. We do have to take that into account. But overall, this report didn't tell us much. Much of the stuff that was covered was already covered. It does, however, defend women who have consensual sexual affairs with married men, home records. It does defend them, calls them abuse survivors, and it cheapens the word. It uses survivor so flippantly, like, sorry, receiving sexually suggestive, whatever that means, not sexually explicit, because we know what that means, receiving sexually suggestive, whatever that means, does not make you a survivor does not make you a survivor. We need to have words have meaning. Um, again, I think I'll close with that. Uh, again, not much going on in this report. It did not tell us a whole lot of new stuff. Most of what was in this report was already known. It was already known. But they paid millions of dollars, and now they have these recommendations. Someone's going to make a motion on the SBC floor to adopt the res uh, the recommendations made by the report. And who knows whether they'll be itemized or bundled. 
But the SBC messengers, as proven last year, are not savvy enough to understand the issues that are in front of them. I'm not trying to be elitist or anything, but I was watching the convention too, and they voted on several bad resolutions, and they rubber-stamped resolutions that had no business rubber sta- being rubber-stamped. They were easily manipulated by crying women. I, I'm not going to take these messengers intellectually serious enough to understand these issues because they've proven not to be intellectually serious enough to understand these issues. So, good luck, Southern Baptist Convention. I honestly think this is another nail in the coffin. This is a very bad report, not because... Uh, actually, it's pretty underwhelming in terms of how much it collected. It could have, again, based on the popular stereotype that lefties and the feminists of the Southern Baptist Convention were touting, there should have been a lot more in this report. There should have been actual new stuff in this report. Instead, it's a lot of stuff that happened in the past that was already known. We did learn about Johnny Hunt. That is something we learned about. And then the recommendations, the policy recommendations that they make are to add more bureaucracy. And I, I don't think that's a good idea. How about personnel changes? It sounds like you had the bureaucracy. It didn't look like the Credentials Committee did a bad job. If you look at the report, uh, you know, the Credentials Committee had a tough job trying to investigate claims that are made through an online portal. And it looks like they did a relatively decent job based on the, the relevant items and cases that the report has. They batted above 500 easily. So, anyway, that's all i got to say about this for now. There will be more on this, and I'm thinking about doing a live stream on this as well. Get some special guest. Uh, Otherwise, have a blessed day. I will catch you on the next one.